Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard and I have a really interesting guest for you today. I'm gonna do two things at once here, which is unusual, but I am going to ask him lots of questions about being a podcaster because this man was in the Podcaster Hall of Fame and he has been, I think, the earliest podcaster I've met yet, which is um, pretty interesting. So, so Gary Leland has been podcasting since 2006, is that, or early? 2004. 2004. 2004, right? So he's got so many podcasts like that over time that he's gone through in terms of fast pitch softball. He's done HT, HGTV style ones, Fix Your Upper podcast, Hometown podcast. Uh, you're a, a, a one of the founders of Podcast Movement. You're in the Podcaster Hall of Fame in 2016. You even have a day named after you in Arlington, Texas. March 1st is Gary Leland Day. <laughs> I love it. So you've got a lot of really interesting things. And in 2006, you won the 50 coolest websites for a podcast website, which is something I love to talk about because really podcasting isn't just about airing all of this. It's also about what you do on the web and, and what you do with your businesses and how you track that afterwards. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the reason you're on New Trust Economy is because you've got Crypto Podcaster, and you've got multiple shows there, The 4-Minute Crypto, BitBlock Boom, Crypto Cousins. I think you've got even a few more than that. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're building in the process of setting up three more right now. We're building a, a crypto media network. Um, I guess kind of when I get into something, I kind of get obsessed with it. I'm kind of attention deficit and I get consumed with it. And I'm into crypto now, so and I'm into creating media. So when I get into something, that's what I do and that's what I'm doing. Right. And so you built some amazing businesses and things over time. And do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of like how you approach these podcasts as a part of a business structure? Well, when I get into uh, doing something new, like I got into cryptocurrency in 2017, maybe August of 2017, I want to learn. So the first thing I do when I'm into a new subject is I create a podcast because then I can call anyone in the world and interview them and they'll talk to me. And oh, instead just, of like, that's a secret right there. Yeah. You just give away the biggest secret. No one says no. It doesn't matter if anyone listens to my shows or not. I don't create my content for other people for the most part. I do later as I get progressing. But when I'm first starting to learn a subject, the podcast is strictly for me. And if other people learn while I'm learning, that's great. If, if I have no listeners, I really don't care, but I can call up. I've called up, uh, John McAfee, and I've interviewed him, Tim Draper, you know, it's two billionaires. I don't think they would have talked to me if I called him up and said, hey, can I ask you about cryptocurrency? You know, but I can learn from the horse's mouth. So that's what I originally do. Or That's how I kind of start my um, com going into a new field is by creating an audio podcast. It's simple. It's quick. No one ever asks how many downloads you get. Isn't I mean, that crazy? They never ask. You're never so ask. right. <laughs> you know, one time for the Gary Leland show, I was wanting to learn, I was doing that to learn to move my brick and mortar store more online into new areas. And I wanted to find out about Amazon. So there's a guy named, I think his name might be Chris Green. He had a book at the time that was $600. And he does, he did at the time, maybe $200,000 every two weeks. That's Amazon's payout period is every right. two weeks. But he did $200,000 every two weeks in sales of products. And so I called him up because I wanted to learn how to do it. And if I had just called Chris and said, Chris, can I have an hour of your time so you can tell me how to make money on Amazon? He just said no. But I called him up. He would have said, I have a program and it'll cost you five grand. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when I called him up on the show, we talked for an hour and a half. He answered all my questions. They were my questions that I wanted to know how to do it. And hopefully someone learned because maybe someone was in the same situation I was. And when we got through, he said, hey, Gary, let's do this again. It was great. And so, I mean, you know, so here I got an hour of one-on-one -on -one time with one of the top guys on Amazon. And he wanted to do it again. And I got all my questions learned and learned how to build an Amazon store. Now, I wasn't successful as Tim, uh, Chris. I think it's Chris Green. Chris was, but I still have two Amazon stores running now because of it, you know, making well, money. So there you go. I know. I love that. That's actually why I started the New Trust Economy. So the New Trust Economy is my way to ask questions and learn because I'm considering we're uh, doing a blockchain venture for our podcast network. And so this was my way of learning. And, um, and it so happened that they 
I was invited to Chain Exchange in Las Vegas last year, and I was invited to interview Steve Wozniak, Gary Vee, a lot of pe- the people who are attending there, all of these you know blockchain guys and women. There were lots of women there as well, and um, and from it, I learned so much that I said, I want to learn more. Let me start an official show. And so, and so that's how it came about. That's how I'm in blockchain and, and, and crypto as well. So it's all about being curious. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, there's no better way to uh, network one-on-one with people you'd never get to network with than there is podcasting. Absolutely. So let's um, talk a little bit about the crypto shows that you're running because there, you've got some really interesting ones. I mean, Crypto Cousins, like that, <laughs> that's a, that seems fun. So are, you're not the host of all of these, obviously. I'm the host of everything I do. You're real. You are the host of all of these shows. Wow. But but, but, but not all of them you saw are shows. Some are just. Okay. Shows. Um, but I'm the host of the Crypto Cousins. I started that in 2017. That's the one I originally started, and I had a co-host with that one I originally started, and we did the first season as two of us. And now, uh, it's strictly my show. The co-host has gone on to something else, and everybody I bring on is my ho- co-host. Oh, and that's so, fun. Yeah. So that's on season episode. I think I filmed episode 88 yesterday, and I do the crypto cause or the four minute crypto show, which comes out every weekday. And we're on episode 264 today, I think. But I do, it's uh, one news article about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in four minutes or less. And wow. So, quick and sweet. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's that's not, great. I mean, you know, and so much is changing. It must be hard to choose one every day. Well, I have, my wife asked me the other night, said, do you have a hard time finding news to do? I said, no, I have, that is the easy part. I mean, it's I hard to figure the, out which one to focus on. <laughs> yeah, all the scripts are written for next week already. I mean, you know, so yeah. that's, uh, that's the easy part to find. And then I'm starting the crypto podcasters, plural, next month. Um, and that'll be where I have three or four friends of mine who are podcasters in crypto space come on the show on a regular basis. Maybe two will be on a regular basis and we'll bring a guest on every week. And it'll be just like a uh, half an hour, 45 minute round table of us just talking with Wade. When you get four podcasters together, it's probably going to be more than half an hour. <laughs> and, then I love it. and then I'm doing something with um, Lynn Ulbricht. I don't know if you're familiar with Ross's mother uh, from the Silk Road, Ross Ulbricht. No, nope, I'm not. Okay. But. He, he's in prison for right now for two double life terms plus 40 years for running a website um, where people could buy stuff with cryptocurrency. Ah. Back in, I guess that happened two or three years ago. So I'm doing a seven episode mini series podcast on the events leading up to his trial, which uh, that'll probably start coming out next month. Well, that is, that's a really trendy area of podcasting right now is to doing these serial style shows, um, Bad Blood with um, the Ranos's, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, you know, was, was also one re- recently that was in podcasting as well, even though it was a, it was a documentary before that, um, or a book before that, actually. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of that going on. I think that's going to be really successful and curious. I mean, we're all very curious about what's the real story. Yeah, well, this is uh, done by from court notes and things like that. You know, it's um, not people's opinions. It's stuff straight from the court notes and what happened. And people can make their own opinion. And uh, the big thing is to me is I'm not saying the guy isn't guilty of a crime, but I don't think you get two life terms and 40 years for running a website, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a long time. That's a, that's, lot of, time. that's a lot of, that's a lot of time. Yeah. Gangsters who haven't got that much who've gone out and shot people. I mean, yeah, this is true. My life term probably would have been enough to be. Yeah, that, that is really time. interesting. So, so let, let's talk about some of the shows that you've run because, you know, I mean, you're running this model of, of being curious about cryptocurrency. And I want to talk about that in a few minutes about, you know, about what about cryptocurrency is exciting you because this is obviously a show on new trust economy and it's the number one question I get. Um, but I really want to talk a little bit about all the shows that you've done over time. So you've been podcasting since 2004. You've had multiple different shows. You know, why do you move on and, and shift shows and, and, and discontinue them? Or, you know, do you discontinue them? Are they still living out there and, and syndicated? Most of the shows I do are uh, evergreen content for the most part. So they pretty much stay on there. I took, I took down one the other day because it just wasn't even worth $5 I was paying on archive hosting on it but for the most part most they still exist 
But I think it's, as I said to you in a pre-show, I kind of have an attention deficit. Once I get something going pretty well, I get burnt out on it. So I, you know, I own the largest wallpaper store in Texas and it's still running and it's still doing great money, but I haven't been inside that building and, you know, in a while, I, I hardly ever go in there because that's not my passion. I think once I get something going um, and complete, I get bored with it and I want to move on to another thing uh, that I do. And I think that's the same way with podcasts. Once I get something going, uh, my first podcast was a podcast pickle show. And when I got to episode 50, I just decided right there on the air, I said, ah, I'm tired of doing this. And I, <laughs> if 50 was a lot of episodes back then in 2000. It was a lot of episodes. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just say, hey, just let everybody know this is my last episode. So, you know, I, I don't think that's anywhere anymore because that we ser- hosted that on our own server. There wasn't really a lot of places to host podcasts back then. Well, you so, mentioned, um, you know, getting business disruption from I- iTunes happening because you started podcasting before there was iTunes. Oh, and it destroyed so- the podcasting. So many things, not destroyed podcasting, but it, is- it destroyed a lot of things that were being built in the podcasting world. So let's talk a little bit about that because there's so many podcasters here who are, you know, post iTunes happening. So they don't have any view of what it was like before then. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you had people who were making hosting sites. You had podcast directories that uh, were young and fledgling to find podcasts. At. You had a lot of tools people were making for, to do the whole podcast experience. And then when, pod, when Apple came out, everything was right there. I mean, you didn't have a use for it anymore. I quit using my own podcast directory. And like I said, it was in Time Magazine's 50 coolest websites. I quit <laughs> even using it. I mean, because iTunes was much better. It downloaded straight into my device. There were people making, to, and, and I'm not saying iTunes wasn't great for podcasting. And I'm not saying it wasn't better for podcasting. Oh my gosh, I used to have to come in and put my iPod in a little stand and wait all night for it to upload my shows so I could have them the next day to listen to on my iPod. I mean, it was really hard work back then. I had to use a third party tool called Lemon. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of work. So it is way better now. It's just, uh, I think sometimes in the back of my mind, I'm still a little upset that my site got killed by it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame funny. you. I don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of too much disruption. Yeah. You got to ease into it. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were maybe the second podcast directory. And if you want to find a podcast, you were going to come to my website or a site called Podcast Alley. And I doubt anyone even knows Podcast Alley anymore or my site, Podcast Pickle. But if you wanted to find a podcast, you probably went to one of those two websites and you did a search and, uh, and you found your podcast there. Right. Interesting. Well, I'm, because we're on the podcast, Ben, before we wrap up and, and start talking more crypto, I have to ask you these five best ways, because this is a part of a, a BuzzFeed article I'm working on. And I think it would really help people get a sense of like what you can do with your podcast that can really improve your businesses and, uh, you know, get, get you answers on something you're very curious about. So let's talk sure. about the lessons and maybe a story or you know, about each one of these things, but, um, the best way to book guests. I personally contact them one-on-one. I, I, I try to, I really try to message them if I can. I try to meet my guests online and message them in person and build a relationship. But I find that if you send, I find when you do on podcasting, if you just email them, most of them respond to that for some reason. I mean, I've had very few that have responded. Like I said, I've, I've really gone up the ladder pretty high you know, my guess. So I think it's just, I don't, I don't think it's how you contact them. I think it's just a matter of contacting them. Most of the people, at least ways in you're in my field, want the press and they're going to respond if they see in the header message, interview request or something like that. I think they, the message header, you know, before they open the email is more important than anything else. Oh, good title. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if they see it's for an interview, they're likely to open it because for all they know, it could be CBS TV or ABC or it could be a, but they'll open it probably. Yeah. Very frequently I title mine. You're right. I title mine PR opportunity and yeah. that's, it's PR opportunity might have a dash and then what it's about, you know, just a little bit about I, what I it usually is. put interview request, you know, yeah. a little more yeah. blank PR to me could mean a chance to be in a magazine. It could be a chance to pay to be in, you know, there are a lot of paid PR. This is like true. That. Yeah. So I put interview requests and I think, oh, they want to see me or hear from me in person. Not, I'm more apt to do that PR. I might not want to write something or something. So that's just my thoughts. Either one's a winner, though. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the best way to increase listeners? Is to work social media, I think. Uh, but, you know, I, I just joined a network. It's, it's the first time I've joined a network. And they asked me if I would put the Four Minute Crypto Show on their network. Uh, it's called the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. Um, if you're familiar with that. And so I put my show on their network. Monday was the first episode they're putting. I do five episodes a week, but they're doing two to start to see how it does. And uh, Monday's show has had six times, seven times as many downloads as I ever have. So the, so the network is helping. <laughs> the, the, in this particular case, I, I, I can't use it as a model of how all networks are. I think it's, it's very important to research the network. And luckily I have, I've been in this business so long, I have a lot of hot friends in high places. <laughs> so I could find out how the network did before, you know, I, I got involved with the network. But if uh, it's a strong network, and, and, it, and you can tell by the shows that are on there, I think, yeah, um, on the network. They wouldn't be on there if they're not doing good. But the network really, like I said, my shows went up, I don't know, not seven times, I'd say nine times. Almost wow. 10. We could hit 10 times today at what my normal show is from oh, Monday. Great. Well, good for you and good for that network. Yeah. So they're doing something right and getting uh, listeners in. So that's yeah. really valuable. And then that, that helps everything. That helps your YouTube. That helps everything because, you know, you're promoting yourself on your show. Hopefully, you're telling people where they can find you at because if someone finds you from the podcast, they may have just listened to a podcast by Fluke. They may be really, they love YouTube or they may really be loving something else yeah that's why we believe in multicasting or brand yeah. casting as we call it here, right? actually yeah call it, yeah you yeah. call it what multicasting multicasting i wrote yeah. a book about that like five years ago multicasting ah wonderful yeah we wholeheartedly to believe believe in that here um yeah. so some tips on how you produce it in a professional way because i'm assuming you did it the hard way in the beginning and it's gotten a little bit easier over time well yeah everything well you know when you're starting with tape you know, on your videos, I had to put in tape. It was kind of, a, you know, hard. Uh, you know, I don't think it's real difficult now to produce a podcast. My thing is just be intelligent about what you're talking about. Or, in other words, try not to lose listeners. You know, because you're going to get listeners who are going to experiment with your show, but you don't want to lose them because your show really is poorly done. Yeah, well, it's hard to listen to or something, yeah. Yeah, it's just simple things like back, background noise. I know a lot of people. I know uh, someone who is a podcaster who's been doing it since 2005, one of the biggest book podcasters in the world. He still does his in his closet because the clothing makes such a nice place for sound. The acoustics are so good in there, no background noises. So I've I mean, heard other I, people, cars and closets are the I, top two. <laughs> I, I hate be listening and hear a car go by or a lawnmower go by or what I really hate and when I listen to a podcast is when they rip out the audio out of a video, which is fine, but they did not do their video in a way that you wouldn't know the audio was ripped out. They said things right. like, look here, see my shirt or whatever. And you know, that's ripped out of a video. You know, I'm going to, oh, they just really isn't even a podcast. They just, they're too damn lazy to do a show for me. And it kind of turns me off. Yeah. So um, I'm saying if you're going to rip out the audio out of your video, at least make it sound like it was created for audio. And that's not that hard to do. It's just how you describe things and talk about things. Right. It's, I always liken it to like being a chef on TV, right? You know, you're doing one of those cooking shows and nobody can taste it. So you're required to describe it. It's right. the same thing when you're showing something because it happens. I'm like, yes. oh, you know. We're talking about something and I want to demo it and you can't do that on the air without describing it. And I think some video people are so into their video that they send their video, their audio out as a podcast, but they never look at their stats and they may find out they're getting more listens from their audio than they are their video views. So maybe they should like make sure their audio is catering to their bigger audience. Right. Guys right there, that is a great tip because we see that very consistently. While a video can add, you know, viewers, the reality is, is that the podcasts tend to do better than the videos do, especially on YouTube. Well, it's, so, the, it's the most consumable content on the planet. Yeah. I mean, what other content can you do when you're driving your car, mowing your grass at work? You know, I mean, it's the most consumable content on the meat on the planet. So yeah. the numbers should be higher. So what, what ways do you do to encourage engagement? So encourage people to talk back to you. 
I'm sure in the Bitcoin world, they're talking back to you. Yeah, I have no <laughs> problem. Because I get a lot of that already, and my show's not that old. <laughs> I have no problem in the Bitcoin world. I really don't do a lot, I would say, for engagement to talk back to me. I ask for their comments and thoughts, and I get a few. Um, but I, I really, like I said, I do most shows for me. So, but I, I cater them to the audience, but I wouldn't say I do a lot. I, I don't do any giveaways. I'm not into giveaways. I don't think I should buy my audience. I don't think that's real audience. I think I that's just making fake numbers. People, you go, oh, I got all these subscribers, but they really aren't listening or watching. I think when you do that, you're just fooling yourself. You go, oh, I got all these numbers, but you're really them. Um, yeah. So I'm more on just putting out good content. I, I think if you put out good content, it's kind of like the TV show that filled the dreams. If you build it, they'll come. And I think if you put out good content, they'll come. It's like, you know, the, the network I'm on, you know, all of a sudden I've been doing this show, just plugging along. I'm getting okay downloads. And all of a sudden, because I'm building good content, they come to me and say, Hey, can we put our content on, on our site, yeah. you know, so, or on their feed. So I think it's just build good content. I think that's the best thing you can do. And I think if your content is good and interesting, people will, I get emails all the time from people in calls and I, I don't even really ask for them, but I think it's the content. So. Yeah, absolutely. So last one, the best way to monetize your content. Well, the best way to monetize your content is how I do. I mean, to be honest with you, or I wouldn't be doing it, but, That's uh, right. <laughs> but wouldn't be doing I don't, it this long for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not real big on monetizing content with other people's ads. I create content or I create a world, either content around my world or my world around my content. Okay, so for instance, uh, two of my podcasts right now, I have the Hometown Podcast for an HGTV show and the Fixer Upper HGTV show, and I own a wallpaper store, and I have two HGTV podcasts. Now, the Fixer Upper Podcast, the lady Joanna Gaines that has that, has a wallpaper book out, has three of them. Well, I sell more Joanna Gaines wallpaper probably than anyone in the country. Probably that makes me more than anyone in the world because I doubt they buy much Joanna Gaines wallpaper in Europe. So I probably sell more of that wallpaper than anyone in the world. And it's from my podcast, you know, about the HGTV shows where we talk about it every time. Now I've got in the crypto world. So I advertise, I made a website called um, cryptocrybaby.com, which sells t-shirts, hats, caps, all kinds of crypto gear. And I advertise that on my show. And I'm doing a conference for my second year called Bitblock Boom. And I advertise that on every episode. So I'm a believer in creating your own sponsorship opportunities instead of selling this. When I first started a uh, fast pitch TV show, Easton Sports, who's a huge company, came up and said, hey, we'd like to sponsor your show. And I was like, really? Wow, okay. How much will you give me? Basically what I was asking. I think we settled on $3,000 for the year back then. And they paid me in advance. I guess they said, oh, we don't mess with that little amount. And I was like, wow. <laughs> And so, but I only had like a hundred listeners, uh, an episode. Well, after the year was over, my listenership had gone up from a hundred to a thousand. So I tried to increase the price and they said no, but those ads are still running on those first hundred episodes of 50 episodes. So I've never really had a sponsor like that again. I've always done shows and sponsored my own act from then on fast pitch TV sponsored my softball store softballjunk.com that was the sponsor and I turned down sponsorship opportunities so I believe the best sponsors are things that you make a hundred percent of the profit on instead of a one-time payment or five percent or an affiliate program for six percent my gosh just find a product make it and sell it people will buy it hey you got an advertising source most people make a product they don't have anything to advertise it on here you got this great advertising source and just do what most people do, make a product and sell it. Except you have an advantage. You have an advertising source. Absolutely. That's well, my thoughts on it. Completely. Yeah. Well, actually, that's why we invented Podetize. So we, in, we invented Podetize because um, we invented Podetize because I didn't want to have old ads in things. And also because our particular, we were advertising events and books and courses. Hey, and I, saw your, uh, I saw your booth down there. I want one of those. Uh, I want your... Tom, to make me one of those flags for my mic. Oh, you want one of our mic he blocks? Those flags, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look at, look at flags. Mine is much bigger. It's a three-sided, but it's much bigger. That's well, a you, good flag. 
I can see you have the right mic for it. So, <laughs> so you have the right mic. We'll send you one. Absolutely. It's yours. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and, and you've got many shows. So if you, if you see mine, I'm, and then this is on the video only guys, but I'm flipping my mic flag around because I have multiple shows. So I flip it to the side when I'm but doing But you can show. pull those out and put new ones in. You can, you yeah. Because my flag, you got to put stickers on. <laughs> yep, exactly. So th we invented it to, uh, to yeah. put them in. I so saw like that there and I was like, Tell me about, I didn't even ask about potter thighs. I saw the mic flags first and said, tell me about those mic flags. Well, and this is a trick. I mean, right now we just, we, we have a new mic launching as well, a new microphone that's meant for live streamers and for people doing event recordings. Um, so you don't have a whole ton of equipment. And we did these things because you're right. At the end of the day, the best way to monetize your show is to have your own stuff. And we've been doing products for 25 years. So, yeah. you know, no, it's definitely not the best way to monetize it. Yeah. yeah, make that make a hundred percent of the profit. Why make eight percent? Why are they giving you eight or six percent? Because there's a lot of profit still left in there. That's right. That's it's right. Not, Absolutely. It's not rocket science. I mean, there's a lot of things you can make. You don't have to invent something to make. I mean, you really don't. In your case, you do. And in my case, I, I kind of do. But Crypto Crybaby, I didn't invent a T-shirt that said Bitcoin on it. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. I didn't invent a T-shirt that says I am Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, these are things I've that are everywhere. I've seen out in the field, by the way. I was like, I want one of those. And now I know where to get yeah. one. So, so glad you said that. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about crypto and, and what you're doing there. Because I'm sure that there's been some really interesting things that you've learned. Because you said that this was a learning experience for you. So you went in there. What's something really interesting that you learned while you were doing uh, your crypto shows? I don't know. If it, I, I have to think a second to say what's interesting. Just my general knowledge of crypto now, I feel, is uh, really high level when you do it every day instead of once a week like i do i mean that's almost my full-time job now is uh crypto i mean i've been mining i i i, I know mining real well i've been mining now for about a year uh, i did a uh, cpu mining and also uh gq mining and i got the uh, asic miners you know set up somewhere so i, I like mining that's a great resource my ASIC miners are off right now, though, because crypto Bitcoin's so low, <laughs> I can't afford to mine it. Yeah. You know, so so that's a bummer. But I don't know that I've learned anything specific, because I have the whole world and all the people I've met. Um, so I, I, maybe I'll think of something in a second. It will be that one thing I've learned. But I I, I have I, I would say I have learned that hodling is not a general rule. It's a it's a guideline, but it's not a way of life. Okay. No, I don't even know what that means. So you're ketting me at so early in my experience of that. You have to explain what hodling is. Well, hodling, someone on a forum some time ago, I think was drunk and they maybe, maybe Bitcoin, and I don't know the exacts on this, but maybe Bitcoin was going from a thousand to a hundred. And they said, are you selling yours? And the guy said, no, nah, I'm hodling. And he was saying holding. But he, oh, it. but he spelled it wrong. Got it. <laughs> and it, it stuck. And then because it was on hold on for dear life, but it stuck kind of. And so now people do a lot of hodling. I know a lot of people who just hodl and people hodl Bitcoin, especially no matter what Bitcoin does. If Bitcoin hit 20,000, they didn't care because they think it's going to be a million and they hold it. And even though it went down to 3000, they weren't worried at all. They're hodling. And so, while hodling is a good thing, you know, uh, if I had sold my Bitcoin at 20,000 instead of hodling to 4,000, I could have bought five times as much Bitcoin when it dropped. So, um, but they they don't want to sell their Bitcoin and then it shoot up. Right. And then they, instead of having 10 Bitcoin, now they got nine Bitcoin because they didn't hodl. You yeah. know, so hodling is holding on no matter what it does, that they're true believers. But I don't really know that hodling is as effective in altcoins. You know, in maybe in coins, yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin, maybe because I, I agree with most Bitcoin maximalists. I think it's got a long ways to go. I don't think you're going to lose money hodling, but I think you could make more money if you didn't hodl. You know, interesting. Now, Monica and I have Monica Provit is the co-host of the show as well. Um, we don't do episodes together except when we talk to each other. We each do separate interviews because she's more on on the uh, I'm going to call it on the financial markets experience than I am. So. We're doing this one because of the podcast angle. But um, the interesting thing that she mentioned is that there's this rumor out there about uh, Japanese housewives 
helping to hold the currency more stable because they are hodling. They are holding for the long term. Is have you heard anything about that? Or do you have any confirmations I, on that? I'm curious. I, I haven't heard. I haven't heard anything on that. And I really believe. I really feel like I am up to date. I mean, so you haven't heard that at all. I thought it was. Oh, and I read cool. probably a hundred articles a day. I mean, or at least glance through that many. <laughs> uh, so I read a lot, but it, that would not be surprising that anyone's hodling, especially when it comes to Bitcoin. Like I said, I know people who have so much Bitcoin and maybe they sold off some at 20000 because they wanted some spending money, but they aren't selling. Matter of fact, I talked to a guy last week who was given, in podcasting, he was given 30 Bitcoins when it was a dollar. And when it got up to, I said, did you sell any at 20000 we had dinner in Austin not telling you this. No, no, I'm waiting until they're a million dollars. I'm not getting rid of any of them. So uh, there's a lot of people who feel that way about Bitcoin. They aren't going to sell them come hella high water. So I I'm, had, saying, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with hodling. I'm saying maybe it's not always the best of case. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the, you know, the statistics on the, the amount of young people in, in Bitcoin, in, for instance, or in crypto in general, um, really shocked me. When I first when I first read about it, and I don't they know what the way more than they do stocks. Yeah, and so I I met this young woman who is um an uh, she's an actress in L.A. and I met her at a party and I and she said she has she's holding Bitcoin and I said why did you invest in Bitcoin? I'm so curious. Why did you go into and doing it? And she said such the interesting thing to me. She said, well, I really felt like learning how to you know, trade stocks or do invest in real estate or do all of those things was um, more complicated to learn than, um, and there was deeper knowledge in there where people have been doing it for, you know, a century, like that kind of thing. And so there's this deep, deep idea that there's, you know, a community that all, you have to be in, in the in crowd to know what to do. But Bitcoin seemed new. And it's only so many years old. And for me, that just felt like people can't be so, such deep experts. And it removed that barrier to entry for me and made it more of a level playing field. And I was like, that was the coolest answer that I had ever heard to why to get into it, right? She felt it was more equal, more level playing field. And I thought, wow, that's a really cool and interesting angle and reason to do it. But I found that well, that's a good angle. But I've also found kids... 25, 30, I'm calling them kids because I'm 64. <laughs> like, uh, I'll talk to my, when I told my nieces I was doing uh, Bitcoin and stuff, they were like, oh my gosh, I love Bitcoin. They were like, really? Say, I love Bitcoin and going on about it. I said, oh, do you have any? And they said, no. And I said, do you know much about it? Goes, no, I just know that I love it. And I'm going, really? It was just kind of weird how much they were into it, but they really didn't know what it was, you know, if yeah. you asked them a question. Well, so I, there's something about that, that uh, about cryptocurrency or Bitcoin that the young, the young people, younger people really want, but they aren't sure, a lot of them, what it is they want. Yeah, they aren't sure. Well, they don't I, like it. They know they like they it. They like more of it. <laughs> yeah, they like more of it, and they like the whole concept. I, well, I don't know if it's the fact it's decentralized, and they just want a decentralized economy or what it is. Which yeah, is yeah I, think, I think there's a lot of that. I, I, I'm seeing that a lot in the, the sort of female population that we tend to be talking to here as well, that there's, this, there's a lot of, of closed markets. There's a lot of that feeling of being disenfranchised in the whole process of how things happen in the banking industry and other things. And I'm, and I'm hearing that from a whole young generation. So I was on Larry King now um, a month ago and in, they asked the questions about crypto and I'm not an expert in it, but I said, look, I, I think that there's no reason why that it's not going to take hold when you have an entire generation who is annoyed by and and disgusted by the fact that a bank says after 8 p.m. Eastern time, uh, you get assessed a fee if you transfer at 8.05. Right. You know, when we live in a 24-hour digital banking world, they know there's not an actual person behind it. They know that. And why and so, does it take so long for my money to get transferred? Right. And, and so they why hear, would you receive it? Do you keep it for 24 hours? It's not like they said, we're going to send you Gary's money from one account to the other, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And so they see that and they go, this is ridiculous and archaic as in their minds. And so they're, they, they're well, waiting for the disruption. So yeah. that's why I think there's a possibility of it. Of well, it. Internet money is the only internet protocol that had not been made yet. It was the only missing protocol. Yeah. So when you look at it that way, it's impossible. And 
you know, in, in Bitcoin's case, you know, if someone owns, I'm going to use the number 10, uh, which is a relative amount of Bitcoin, but it's not like, you know, you got to be a millionaire to have 10 Bitcoin. You will have more Bitcoin than it's possible for 0.001% of the people on the planet to own when this goes crazy. So if you've got one Bitcoin, you're going to have more than 0.3 people. I mean, it's amazing this because of the fact there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin ever. Um, you know, when this stuff goes hog wild, you know, you're, there's going to be some people who get real rich real easily without much Bitcoin because there's just not enough to go around. If you think about it, if every millionaire, I think just in the United States said, I wanted the Bitcoin, there's not enough Bitcoin for them. And you have people like Tim Draper who already have 225,000 Bitcoins or something. You know, so, I mean, it's definitely not enough for every millionaire to own a Bitcoin. So right. I, I believe, personally, I'm not a financial advisor, but I believe people should put 1% into Bitcoin. Because if they lose, and, and I'm wrong, and it did go to zero, well, you lost 1%. But the chances are it could go up 1,000%. So your possible gains to your possible loss are huge. So... It's, it's just a matter of what you can afford to lose. No one should put more than it can afford to lose. But I think whatever your financial situation is, 1% of your savings is not more than you can afford to lose. I mean, that happens right. when the stock market tanks. You lose right. 1%. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, this is where I think, you know, our show is really much more, uh, a little more focus, focused on the business blockchains, the business that are building, the business that are offering coin and other things. So we tend to talk a lot more about that side of it rather than the currency itself. And, yeah. and so, but I, I do hear from so many people, the reason why they're listening to my show is that they are listening because it, they're considering bringing blockchain into their business. They're considering taking cryptocurrency as a part of their store, if that's what it is. Well, I do that on my websites in my store. And, and by the way, I'm not a financial advisor. I just was talking off the cuff there. But no, I, no, no, that's yeah, good. That's, just, that's my personal feelings. But yeah, I take uh, Bitcoin in my stores, both of my retail stores, on my websites. Um, you know, I don't get paid very often, but when I do, I'm pleasantly surprised. Well, and this is the, this is the challenge that I think I'm, I'm asking you about here is that when we are, when we are talking about these things and we have someone who's, who's curious about how to get into it, what we're not finding really easily is that sort of basics information of how do I get started investing in Bitcoin? How do I uh, get started taking cryptocurrency in my store on my website? Is there a wallet? Is there, what, what do I have to do? And the problem that we find is that the books that are out there are awful. I mean, they're awful. I don't know how they're, they're like, you know, let's, let's do 101, which Monica wrote the 101 book is a great description of what these things are, but it doesn't tell you how to go about doing that. And I think that's missing in the marketplace. Do you guys talk about that on your show? Do you get into that? We really don't get into that um, unless I interview someone who happens to be in that world. We do have, and I, I can't even think of the name of the company. I use a service on my websites, which is really just a WordPress plugin um, for coin for crypto. And you go to their site and you set it up. It takes about 30 seconds to set up and add the, well, it takes longer than 30 seconds, but it's really easy to use. Yeah. You add the plugin, you go to their website, you set up your account. You put in what cryptos you want to take. You tell them right then, do you want to receive crypto or you want to receive cash? And if you want to receive crypto, you give them a wallet to put it in. If you want to receive cash, they cash it out and send you the cash value at the time so you're not losing. Uh, right. I guess when the market's dropping like crazy, you want to get the cash. When you think the market's going to go wild, you want to get the crypto. And I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name of that tool that I use right now. Well, you can several actually... Like that. Yeah, if, if you don't mind sending it to me later, I will make sure to update the post with it. So if you guys go to newtrusteconomy.com, we'll make sure that it's in the blog post for this episode and um, we'll make sure that that's in there. But you know, that's yeah, great. Like, one can set it up too. Yeah, and this is what I think people don't realize is how accessible that is, right? It's, it's not as hard. There are plugins being created. There are apps. There are wallets. There are all of these things out there. But it does still seem like to those, this is what I've discovered, is the, to those young people or even to some of us older folks, 
who, it, who really just don't understand anything that's not conventional, like it's not offered by our bank, we don't understand how we're, how we're supposed to get into that. And so that is uh, what I'm hoping my show will be able to sort of bring that angle in and introduce more and more of those things and more and more resources like you where now they can watch the market. Listen to what's going on in the news. They've got four minute crypto at their at their fingertips on their on their phones. Every weekday. And so that's what I, I love it. Of. Yeah. But I enjoy doing it. You know, really since I started doing that podcast, uh, my knowledge really started increasing. Because now I look at so many blogs and I subscribe to so many things or they're in my feed like blog reader. But I look at so many articles now where I didn't before that when something happens like like the other day, uh you know, somebody came up to me and said, oh, I heard about this thing. And I said, oh, man, that's like a month old. But it was just getting the network TV. You know, they heard it on network radio or something like that. And I'm going, oh, you know, that's funny. Right. So by the time the public hears it, you're so behind the, the timeline. And also, I think the, the problem with the public when it comes to wanting to buy cryptos and stuff is they base it off of TV. And by the time it gets on TV and the news, they're so behind the timeline <laughs> that the price is already jacked because all the people – found out about it 30 days earlier. It just took that long to make the mainstream media. Yes, this is so true. And that's why I feel like podcasting, we're a little bit on the edge because we're out there, we're reaching out to the movers and the shakers and the new people and the people we're curious to learn from and know. So we're inviting them on in the early stages to get to know them and get to know what's going on. So I do feel like we have an edge. (laughs) Everybody should do it. There's not too many. I mean, you think about it. I think there's like, a hundred million blogs and there's something like 600,000 podcasts. Yeah. And so. the numbers that I heard recently was that there's less than 250,000 English speaking active podcasts because a lot of them well, are active is the key there. Yeah. Active. So they're posting new episodes and that's really where you can. And in crypto, that's really happened since the prices dropped. If you go to crypto podcasts and go on uh, iTunes and look at them and look at the date of the last episode. Oh my gosh. One out of 10. I mean, Nine out of 10 haven't done a podcast since August of last year. Right. Because you know, they're not making any money because they were trying to sell sponsorships or whatever reason. And now the, and maybe they're out because they lost all their Bitcoin. <laughs> Who knows? That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, the last question I want to ask you before we go is because, you know, hey, there's six degrees of separation out there. This is a new trust economy podcast. Maybe some of our listeners or some, some of our guests um, may know someone. Who would you like to have on your show that you haven't gotten yet? Um, Andreas Antonopoulos. I'd like to have him on my show. I've, ah. I've pretty much gotten almost everybody I've won him and uh, I've been trying to get Tom Lee with uh, Funstrat, but he's committed to come on the show. We just haven't set the day. Okay. Cause I was going to say, I know Tom Lee because he's, he's right here in Irvine. So uh, well, he, he uh, told me he'd come on the show and gave me his business card. And he said, here, use my personal email because I had been sending it to a generic email. Yeah. So I'm just waiting. I just emailed him the other day. So I'm waiting to hear back because I, I enjoy seeing him on TV and he's I, a big Bitcoin bull and so am I. I had a five minute interview with him when I was at Chain Exchange and that's how I met him. And it was the most interesting conversation. And I was like, it could have gone on and on. So and give him a good nice block guy. of time. He's super he's nice and he's amazing. Super nice. And knowledgeable. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you'll look. You'll enjoy that episode. I know I will. I'll be listening in for when that happens too, because I want to hear him. So, well, wonderful. Well, Gary, I'm so glad you came on the show. I'm so glad we got to talk podcasting and crypto and all things, um, all things fun about what's changing in the marketplaces as well. So, um, thank you for sharing that with us. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to leave my listeners with? Anything you'd like them to know uh, both about podcasting and crypto? Um, well, in podcasting, I've been saying this for twelve years now. Just start. I mean, if you want a podcast, just start. It doesn't matter if it's good. It doesn't matter if it's bad. It doesn't matter if you have an intro. It doesn't matter if you have an outro. It doesn't matter if you have anything. Just pick up your phone. Your iPhone or Android phone has everything you need to start. The recorder on there is fine. Because here's what I found out. People who wait until they think they have everything perfect, no matter how you wait, no matter how perfect you make it before you start, when you listen to that first episode in a year, it sucks. Yes, it does. So you might as well get the first one out the way because you can't start improving until you start doing. And so go ahead and start doing, and then you can start improving it. And maybe a year later, and and the guy who's waiting until he's perfect, you'll have half a year advantage on him. So just start it. Um, And number two is 
check out cryptopodcaster.com. Check out my Please. site. Yes, absolutely. Those are my two tips. Yeah, cryptopodcaster.com. Gary Leland, thank you so much for joining me today. Everyone, this has been Tracy Hazard from the New Trust Economy. You can find us at newtrusteconomy.com and also on social media at New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear more about uh, what you are looking for, what you'd like us to cover. Would you like more crypto episodes? Let us know. We'll have Gary back again <laughs> because I'm not an expert. So we'll have Gary back again if that's the case. But thank you all for listening. We really appreciate your time.